Welcome to Devalue with Mike and Caroline, the place where we talk about art and money and how creative people are navigating the ever-changing landscape of trying to make a living for their work. We're going to be interviewing all types of creative people, and we'll be talking about all types of issues that creative people face. We hope you'll get something out of it. We're excited to welcome you to Devalued. Hey, Mike. Hey, Caroline. Who are we talking to today? We are talking to New Zealand poet Hira Lindsay Bird. Um, she is one of my favorite writers, and she's written a lot of books called Pamper Me to Helen Back. Hira Lindsay Bird, self titled. She writes a great advice column for the spin off. And it was a really awesome conversation. Her first poet. She's really funny. She's everything I hoped she would be after reading her work and more. Her work is like super funny, um, very full of pop culture references and like mixing high and low brow humor. And it's full of jokes. So I can't recommend it highly enough. And I knew nothing about the world of a poet, how how it all works. Uh, but now I think I have a at least a little bit of an idea. It might be a little bit nicer, the poetry world of New Zealand, rather than in America, but from what she was describing, it sounds pretty, pretty nice. Yeah. Well, let's give it a listen. And when we didn't rhyme at all. (laughs) No rhymes. There was no rhymes. (laughs) All right, here you go. We generally start out by asking if you think art and money go together. In an ideal world, no, <laughs> absolutely not. But um, in the in the capitalist world we all live in, I have to sort of find a way, unfortunately, because um, probably like many other people, I never really got a um, – and what am I trying to say? I'm not really capable of doing anything else, so I've sort of backed myself into an artistic – a corner but um yeah in a in an ideal world it would just be full miniature train enthusiast hobby um (laughs) (laughs) working that would be amazing Mm -hmm. so how does a poet like make a living in 2023 because i know like in the you know lord byron days he would have like a someone like completely funding his lifestyle like a sugar daddy or like (laughs) keats would have like a patron Mm. and they would live on his estate or like yates had like lady gregory and he lived in her like tower thing without a bathroom (laughs) how does a poet make money in 2023 i have often thought about like putting an ad in the classifieds and saying like is anyone still looking for like a henry james style patron (laughs) like a young woman you can take to italy i'm not a young woman anymore but um that that was such a good arrangement honestly they they really you know they knew what they were doing back then although i I suspect half of them were um you know lord byron had to have been rich already right yeah i think yeah he probably was being a lord (laughs) (laughs) which is crazy um, and speaking of Lord, I know she's a fan of yours, which is also crazy that a pop star um, likes a poet's work in this age. That must be weird. Yeah, it is weird. I think that um, I, it's probably a rude thing to say to all of the poets, but I'm always more excited when um, a, a musician I love like compliments my work. I think the best one I ever had was David Berman wrote me an email once and I just about like lost my mind because he's just like my favorite person of all time. Mm-hmm. That is that awesome. Was like ten surprises to me. Like I was like, "All right." Done. Wow. What did he? What did he say? Do you mind sharing what he said to you? Yeah, he says, um, "I'm I'm working for this really amazing carpet manufacturer. You can have anything you like, fifty percent off." <laughs> <laughs> no, he just like, he just kind of wrote like slightly anonymous email. He didn't introduce himself or anything, but I, you know, I recognized his name, and he was just like. It was, it was just like one line, like something like, "Hey, you're you know you're the funniest writer going at the moment," and I kind of like looked at his email address and I was like, "No, it can't be." Um, and then I asked him, and then I think he got quite embarrassed about it. But that was like, yeah, that was, um, you know, like book awards meme shit compared to that. Like that was <laughs> that was um, so cool. That's amazing. And David was definitely a musician and poet. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. 
And he, in fact, I actually knew him from actual air before I ever knew his like the Silver Jews or the Purple Mountains or anything. Like that. Oh so wow! I actually didn't know him as a poet first, but I just think that's not how. Um, yeah, I guess more people know him as me. So. And we're in Nashville, so this is his old uh, stomping grounds here. I actually met David Berman one time at a comedy show, and he um, like bummed like ten cigarettes for me, and uh, <laughs> he was telling me about like Enron and stuff for like twenty minutes, and I was like, oh, I should probably go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone needs a good David Berman story, I think. Well, I mean, getting back to your stuff, so, like, um, how did you get into writing poetry, and, like, how did you know that it was going to become a, like, a, 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 a vocation or a career? Like, how did you know that was going to happen? Um, well, it was definitely, and still isn't meant to be a vocation or a career. <laughs> and, in fact, I don't um, really make enough money off it to justify calling it that, um, at the moment, um, actually for the last 15 years, I've had the same job, which I absolutely love, which is I sell children's books. And that's like my other major passion. And Poetry was kind of a, a bit of an accident as well. Like I grew up with a really, a, you know, super um, liberal family who would had like, you know, my parents had great artistic dreams for their children and introduced us to heaps of, li we grew up in a house with lots of um, basho and um, all of the you know the great haiku poets and stuff um, and so like we'd be writing poetry from a pretty young age and then I gave it up for about you know for my high school life I, you know yeah anyway I kind of I took a basically I took a university course on a fluke um, years and years later and I was I, I just had really good timing because I met this woman um, who's from the Iowa workshop every every summer over here we have like two teachers from the Iowa workshop who are recent graduates come over and teach like an undergraduate summer class and um, I had a woman called Lauren Barrier Gould who was super amazing and she just like introduced me to every single contemporary American poet I've never heard of like Matt Gladner, Matthew Zapruder, um, Emily Kendall Frey, Heather Crystal, like all of the all of the people who were like the big names in the, uh, this little chapbook presses. You grew up with Wilfred Owen, you grew up with the war poets, you grew up with Shakespeare so that like blew my mind. And I think that was the point at which I was like, all right. Yeah, I feel like like all of that stuff is so good to to learn and you come to love it like later. But it's for me, it wasn't like that was not an exciting introduction to like contemporary poetry. That was like a act of like decoding or translation or something. Is that what you feel like poetry is for? Um I don't know. I don't know what poetry is for. I think poetry is for people who want to be musicians, but they don't have a good singing voice. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. We were it's thinking the class. opposite. We were thinking that uh, art, like musicians, want to be poets. Yeah. Well, I think that like so many musicians have published books of their lyrics, which are always kind of um, odd because. You know, either you've either you've got the um, the ghost of the melody under everything you read, or you just don't don't know their songs, and you kind of come to the lyrics and you're like, "What is this about?" Um, although I do have the Scott Walker lyrics, rock, I have to say, but um, yeah, I think absolutely. If I was a better musician, I would quit being a poet immediately and um, become a musician. There's also weirdly heaps of like musicians that are quite good children's books writers, like. The guy from the Decemberist writes this really good like children's fantasy series. There's a whole bunch of people who are like indie musicians who have sort of transitioned to the world of children's books, which I find quite interesting. I have a side career. A lot of like legacy or like um, like boomer artists, like Lou Reed, for example, like really wanted to be a poet so bad. I think it was because they are they're insecure about rock and roll or something and they want like the prestige of like academia or like to be published <laughs> as a poet but i mean like when like what you're saying like when you actually read like lou reed's lyrics it's like it's pretty bad <laughs> <laughs> well that's the amazing but like I, one of my favorite um lyricists is um bonnie prince billy and like he 
um, I don't know, people who's like, if you take their lyrics away from the music, it just like something that's like so, so profoundly simple that like it looks stupid by itself on the page, but like the, the magic is obviously like the interaction between that and the music. And that's something that's really hard to do in poetry because if you make things like as simple as possible, it doesn't have that kind of, yeah, I don't know what I mean, but I think that you can, um, there's, there's a there's a reason sometimes that good lyrics sound bad when the music's taken away and, and they should, you know, because the music's doing so much of the heavy lifting or like changing the context of the words in an important way. It sounds like, well, the, maybe this is just a trend that I'm kind of noticing through um, observing different creative avenues and how people are trying to make money in them. It sounds like there's uh, kind of the avenue where you can make money. It sounds like children's books are a nice avenue for a person in literature. And then the pure thing, the thing that may not be as commercially viable, um, in this case, poetry is what you do to connect and express yourself without the pressures of finances. Yeah, I'm doing some other little bits of writing which I get sort of paid for at the moment, which is something I haven't really done before, like regular writing for money, or I've never been very good at it. I think I started a column once before and I, t- <laughs> I, th- I managed about two before I was like, nope, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> um, and so I've got like a little advice column um, at the moment, which is one of my ways of um, making a weekly income. And that's quite fun because it's sort of like halfway between like something that's practical but also you get to be a little bit like um you know a bit florid and wild with the prompts (laughs) and um, I'm also doing like a little video game spec script at the moment for a friend who's got like a little video game company so that's quite cool because actually I've taken it's been years and years since I've done anything that's really poetry related because I published so much of it so fast and then I kind of thought that's enough of that for now. So I've been, my other, my, the projects I'm sort of doing in my spare time are also ones that not pay, don't pay any money, but they're kind of like longer novels or I've got like a kids, kids book project that I've been working on for like some stupidly like long amount of time, like, you know, Donna Tart taking 10 years to write a book except for this is like a children's <laughs> fantasy time travel series, which really doesn't deserve all of the time that I've spewed into it. But. Does your government yeah. help? L- little bits of money drifting in. Mm-hmm. Does your government um, fund artists very well? Um, we don't have anything so exciting as like an artist living wage. Like I say, they're trying out in Ireland and places like that. We do have a thing um, which is, I'm sure there's like an equivalent in all the other countries, which is like um, arts funding grants, which you can apply for, but it, they typically don't pay you very much money. Um, mm. And this is quite a like a lot of paperwork. So I w- I've been quite lucky to get like a few little ones of those before. But um, yeah, really, it's like trying to find um, sort of enough work that I can like subsidize my hobby at the moment. I think we need um, to get Lord to fund you. Yeah, Lord, Lord should be Shirley your has a guest house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. But that classified in the paper. I'm sure there's lots of um, elderly benefactors out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in Nashville. Yeah, in come course. on over. We're looking too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you? Um, I well, I guess. You had a lot of success kind of right out of the gate, it seems like, in in reading about you. And I think that a lot of poets or aspiring poets wonder how you can be successful. I think a lot of poets that I know, um, they just want to get published. And I think that's enough. And like, you've, you've had like success, like where your poems have gone viral, or you, you know, you've, you've been published by like Penguin. So how did you like, how did that happen? Can you like walk us through that? Um, yeah, it's, it happened completely by accident. Like I just, um, I'd done my, you know, I did my MA in poetry, um, like 
like I guess so many, you know, people in America, I know you're all um, sort of got so many good MFA programs over there um, and stuff. So I did, I did the New Zealand equivalent. There's like a couple of them in the country. One of them was at a university. And then like um, I didn't publish anything from that book that I wrote but that um, sort of put me in touch with the university publishers who are also the external accessors of the course and so basically my publisher is like a university publisher over here and um, they just kept asking me for a book every couple of years and then um, when it came out just a couple of pieces sort of randomly got published on one of our local sort of news and culture websites actually the same site that I'm writing the advice column for now weirdly enough and um, just kind of got picked up around the world by lots of different people and it's sort of like a weird like it's a weird thing to talk about really what that means in terms of numbers I don't know whether that's like um, you know something they say on the back of um, books as a publisher's blurb to make you sound more interesting than you are. I don't really know how many people like ever read, actually read those poems. Um, so it sort of feels like a bit of a um, mystical um, question mark hanging in there somewhere. But it did mean that eventually it was like read widely enough that it um, got picked up by Penguin, like I had a really good, there's a really amazing woman who's a really good writer in her own right called Kirsten, who's the publicist for the university press. And she wor worked like really super hard to like send it out to lots of different companies around the world and stuff, which I think is one of the, you know, nice advantages of publishing with a really small university press is like, there were so many people who give so much time and attention to each of their books. And I think that that was, Part of why I was lucky like I just had a there were a really amazing group of publishers that worked really hard to get it into lots of hands of festival directors and um yeah never made it to the US but it was pretty crazy that it got picked up by Penguin because you never really sell enough poetry in New Zealand to do anything than eventually write another poetry book <laughs> and then there is there a live element when you're promoting a, a new book do you travel around and talk to people about it or is it kind of you put it out and hope for the best um I ended up doing a little bit of traveling just around like the you know after your book comes out you get like if you're lucky you get a couple of like little local festival organizations and so I did a few readings of it there and um I got to go to like Australia which was um, pretty cool and then um, a couple of other random company uh, countries invited me to come over like I got to go to Mexico which was fucking awesome but um, I've never been like an amazing performance poet or anything like that like I try to you know I think that it's important to if you're going to do a poetry reading and all not um, be like standing on stage shuffling your feet looking like you'd rather be <laughs> at home with a cup of tea which is of course what everyone in the room is doing um so like I made an effort but I, you know I'm not like a um yeah I'm definitely not a, a very charismatic live reader or so I don't think um don't really think that helped <laughs> I would be surprised if that were the case because your work is so full of personality we were kind of talking about um what we like about what you do and it's simultaneously really highbrow you know it's beautiful poetry but it also has a lot of uh pop culture references jokes and, yeah super funny uh-huh yeah love jokes <laughs> <laughs> so it would be very it would it would surprise and confuse me if in real life you weren't like that at all Well, um, yeah, I think that the humour was really, like, important to me. And I think when I was, you know, when I did that course before, like, two of the people that I were introduced to, which, like, just totally changed my writing life, were um, I, I was introduced to the work of Mark Leidner and Chelsea Minnis, who I'd never read before, but who were, like, my two of my absolute heroes and who I've just read constantly for about 10 years now. And I think that, like... <laughs> Yeah, that sort of um, opened up 
my mind to like what you know what you could really do with poetry because they're they're both kind of like that as well like that they're, they're so there are so many like dense clever references but there's also like such freedom to be um catastrophically dumb as well which i really <laughs> appreciate what a great term yeah <laughs> well i think everyone kind of knows what big success looks like for musicians you know you get a private jet and you're flying around and you uh play to stadiums and you have adoring fans what is the what's the goal like the top of the top for a poet um anything that gives you an unprecedented amount of money probably <laughs> i don't even know what it would be I, maybe there's some sort of like um I'm trying to think of who the best person to sponsor me would be. And all I can think of is my favorite chocolate milk company in this country, which I don't think would be like a very lucrative deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, yeah, uh, finances aside, like the thing that makes me like feel the most successful is like, I still get um, ran emails from like random teenage girls around the world. And I'm like, how are you finding my book? It's not even available in your country, but that's like, that, that gives me, like, moments of um, feeling like Stevie Nicks or whatever. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though I never get a good, wouldn't get a good rider. <laughs> so you mentioned, you're, you mentioned, like, all these poets that, um, like, changed how you think about poetry. Were you, like, a fan of poetry as a kid or as a teenager? Um, like, how did you get into poetry in general, like, to begin with? Um, yeah, I did. I did always love poetry. Like I, you know, we grew up with um, my dad studied Chinese history. So we had a lot of really kind of um, not just um, old Chinese poets in the house, but lots of really kind of amazing, um, kind of quite ancient poetry. And then like every year my dad would get me a poetry book for my birthday. It just sort of became a thing. So I think I got Emily Dickinson for my 14th and E.E. E. Cummings for my 13th and stuff. So um, I did grow up on one of those like annoying, you know, when you hear someone sort of talk about like how they came to do what they did and it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> your parents got you the baby Picasso art set when you were three years old. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, you know, like my, my parents had a um, big influence on that because they were, you know, they're both really widely read and um, interested in art and literature. And then I think, um, yeah, maybe I, I think when I was a bit older, I, I sort of, I read a lot of fiction as a teenager and kind of um, my interest probably waned a bit then until, you know, as I was saying, I came back to university and I did that one course that just like totally flipped my lid. But um, yeah, I always grew up with like, like one of the things I like, I, I'm really obsessed with and um, I do as a hobby is I go through and I find children's poetry. Like um, Kenneth Coe wrote these like really amazing um, poems with all of these, I think these sort of New York children in the 60s or 70s and he wrote a book about teaching them to write poetry and if you read it or you read any like poems by children you're like children are the true true poets like the <laughs> some of the lines in there like it, you know john berryman couldn't have done it in his wildest dreams you know like but a six-year-old child can just like say this thing and you're like oh my god um anyway so like obsessed with like collecting children's poetry collections i can't even remember where i was going with this tangent oh my gosh that's what, that's what podcasts <laughs> but, um, are for yeah <laughs> sorry that's the whole yeah. point of podcast <laughs> yeah. right um but yeah oh, I, anyway so i was going back and i um you know my, my parents kept all of our old I, I don't know whether they were in this in this country it's the same as in the states but i feel like when i was growing up there was like you'd have to write a poem every week at school or something which is always a bit tedious but you can i can go back now and i can look at those poems and mine are like hands down the worst in the class because everyone else is writing these like amazing concise like beautiful weird haikus about star trek um, <laughs> And my poems are like seven page, like really florid descriptions of the <laughs> light shimmering, like <laughs> distinctly on the radiant twilight lake. You know, I think I'd been um, really, really taken the, the lyric pill at an early age. 
which doesn't make for good poetry, but I think. Um, it makes for long poetry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> poetry seems really difficult to me because it does seem like you're trying to access this pure part of yourself as an observer of life and your feelings and thoughts and all these things and expressing them um, without trying to be a poet. Yeah, I, I like some of the stuff I like is quite, you know, really plays with that, like the concept of like the poet with a capital P. Like, I don't know if you've ever read Chelsea Minnis's poetry, Poem Land, but it's like one of the most hysterically funny, weird books about like, um, about, you know, the, the capital P poet and everything is like, you know, there are more like swans and sunsets per like square inch in that book. Than, like, <laughs> in but it's like, you know, she's, she's playing with you. It's delightful, you know, it's, um, and so like, I, I, I sort of like that kind of like overly, um, accessorized kind of like heavy, um, poetry that really like plays with the idea of, um, sort of the weird artificiality or like the, um, I don't know what do you call it the tropes of poetry i think that's really fun but also like i agree i think that you know the some of the most like beautiful poems are the are the people who can just like say the simplest thing in the most surprising and profound way which has never really been like <clears throat> my school of poetry i've kind of always gone to the um aesthetic extreme because obviously it's a lot harder to say the most beautiful perfect thing in the simplest way possible and if everyone could do it we'd have you know, um, we'd have a lot of be, bad poetry <laughs> 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 i mean have you ever run into people who like look at you askance because you say like i'm a poet when they ask you what you do because like when people think about the capital p poet they think of really ineffectual people that are um completely useless like they they're probably they don't know how to load a dishwasher <laughs> you know they probably smell like uh cigarettes and like um popcorn like really <laughs> really <laughs> terrible combinations <laughs> and they I have one of the main attributes of being a poet which is that i i can't drive <laughs> and i feel like it's a real joke. i don't know whether it's an international joke or whether it's a new zealand joke but like um, yeah, most I feel like there's like a, an unbelievably high percentage of people I know who are poets who also just like cannot drive a car. And I feel like there's something in there. <laughs> there's something, some grain of truth hidden somewhere in there. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I wouldn't trust myself with heavy machinery. But <laughs> yeah, I, I also would never like introduce myself as a poet unless I wanted to be like bullied in public for some reason. Like, the only time I it's like under duress at a writer's festival but um yeah i would i would never make that bold claim about myself <laughs> how do you introduce Even yourself was... or you is it, how do you introduce yourself or is it as common i mean in in america anyway it's very much like hi how are you i'm caroline what do you do that seems mm. to be like a very immediate question and uh sometimes i wonder if all countries are like that yeah, I think, I think we, you know, we do say that, we do ask that about people over here, which is not really the best way <laughs> to find out what, um, you know, what someone's really sort of about or what they're like, but, um, you know, it's such a default question. I think usually I would just um, say that I was a children's bookseller because I think that, like, makes me sound a lot better and more interesting than <laughs> coming out and saying, well, actually, I'm a poet because, um I feel like that's also something you don't really want to get into a conversation most of the time, unless you're on a podcast with two people who like you and have invited you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, it's like it's quite, it's quite an awkward thing to say to someone, and then you know you don't really you really don't want any follow up questions about like what's your book called or what do you write about, um, which would be even worse. So yeah, usually <laughs> I would just like tell people that I sell children's books for a living, which sort of feels like. A much more fun thing to talk about because then you can like easily sidetrack the conversation into oh what is your what what picture books are you guys reading at the moment which is like a conversation i never get sick of having so there's also like a lot of um like cynical people that would i would imagine that you have to deal with because like i remember 
when I was in college and studying literature, like the worst people ever would, you know, they would say things like, you know, I want to be a poet. And then um, they would immediately get into a conversation about like, you know, do you know this poet or do you know that poet? And like, they get like territorial about what they know. And then they like bully you for not knowing as much as them. <laughs> It's um, it's that like feels so like strange. Working at a record shop. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it is so. Um, it's it feels daunting because they just they want to like break your spirit with their <laughs> with their knowledge. You know. I feel like that's one of the that's kind of it's it is a really funny dynamic in poetry, and I kind of enjoy it in a little way because people are really you know I think the more niche your subject is, like probably the more like the less you're getting paid for it, right? Like the more you know about <laughs> like Coleridge, like the less effective you are probably are in yeah. other areas of your life. And so when someone comes along and they're like, you know, they're, they're doing something that you don't, don't have any aesthetic interest in or you or you just like people become like a lot more like territorial and proprietary around their special topic. But that's also great because it's so funny like <laughs> people take it so seriously that like then the chance to make fun of it is um just irresistible like again Chelsea Minnis poetry poem land like that is a book to that I think is specifically designed to infuriate as well as like edify <laughs> and you know it's, it's it's beautiful and it's weird and it's um uncategorizable but it's also like full of lines that would you know if you read them to your tennis and loving grandfather <laughs> he would like spit his dentures out across the room <laughs> if there's not one already i would definitely watch a movie like best in show or spinal tap or um yes. life aquatic or something about poets yeah because there's that movie bright star about keats and he's yeah. it is like the worst movie of all time because he's <laughs> it's it's like a a british soap opera where like he's like this really frail weak beautiful man who's like dying mm -hmm. but he, but like he's writing poetry and it's like there's like like illustrative scenes where like it's like in the stars or whatever and it's so <laughs> bad it's almost like uh if connor obers wrote the movie <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad <laughs> <laughs> I would watch the Connor Oberst movie. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, it's especially with Keats as well. Like he's he's just got such a good, um, like tragic legacy. Like you 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 just really want to go. Like my my memories from that film. Like that's a New Zealand director actually, Jane Campion, who did that movie. And like the the main thing I remember is I think someone's just like lying in a field of wildflowers on the cover, which is like such a high class, like <laughs> um top shelf poet image. I you know, nobody <laughs> yeah. nobody has the legacy that Keats have. Like, God, may we all be so lucky to die of tuberculosis at I can't remember how old he was. But. I think twenty seven or something. Yeah, and he, and he was a doctor. Than I am now. Huh. Yeah. I mean, was he a doctor? Yeah, he was a doctor. He was the worst doctor in the world. I guess so. Because he, um, <laughs> you know, was his own patient. I don't think you're supposed to be that. Yeah, no. <laughs> I think most people would discourage that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, was he letting his own blood all the time? I can't remember. I might be getting confused with... Um, I just read all of the Hilary Mantel mirror and the lights, you know, the um, Henry box and... There's a lot of bloodletting that's happening in that. That sounds like a terrible way to treat anything. Is there a lot of um, <laughs> like competition in like the New Zealand poetry circle? Because I know like here, it seems that you know everybody. It seems to be like a cutthroat, um, very competitive uh, cottage industry of like poets who are like, "You got into that? Like, fuck you! I hate you." <laughs> super jealous you know it's like is that does that exist in your circle um a little bit but the stakes are so different because like you know in in the states there really isn't in terms of like scholarships and prizes and stuff there really isn't enough to go around for the amount of poets you guys apparently have like i think you maybe 
I don't know how accurate this is, but I feel like there must be some link between the United States and the New Zealand having like really high amounts of poets per capita because like we have a lot of poets for the size of our population, but we still have such a small population that <laughs> you can conceivably um, expect, you know, if you're, if you're having a long career as a poet, say you write your first book in your early 20s and you keep writing all the way through until your 70s or your 80s, you can expect to get like, um, you know, one of the major residencies at, at one stage of your life. Whereas I don't think, you know, they're sort of just like passed around in a, um, yeah, I don't know, pass, passed on from person to person and everyone seems like they sort of get a, a better crack here than they do in the States, which, you know, with, there's just seems to be so many people graduating from MFA programs and things like that. Um, but, yeah, there's definitely, like, a very large amount of poets in this country and, and I think that's kind of, it, it means that there's lots of people that have kind of set up little funds and there's lots of people that are doing reading series and there's lots of people who ha ha run small journals and stuff and it's really like a, a labor of love as well so there's there is like um quite a healthy poetry community because I don't know whether we just have like the tr tradition of like a lot of poetry over here or whether <laughs> whether it's just sort of like you know, we're at, at a Richard Scarry level of like, there's enough room for everyone to take a turn being the village hairdresser. You know, everyone can be <laughs> poet laureate because now poet laureate ships only last for one year, like unlike in the UK where you have like a 10 year stint, which is crazy. Wow. <laughs> if everyone was poet laureate in America, it'd be a really, really weird poetry <laughs> collection. Yeah. Yes. I but that sounds really nice. Poet laureate at the moment. I think, was it like, I don't, I don't know who it is either. I think it was Louise Gluck, like the poet laureate here for a while. I don't know. I could not tell you. Yeah. I'm bad at Jeopardy. <laughs> How would you, if since you're in a scene that's very populated and we are too, how would you recommend people set themselves apart as a poet? Um... I think that maybe, I think that I've always felt lucky in New Zealand because in a weird way, there's so, you know, there's like such a wide world of international poetry out there and we have such a small, like little national tradition that if you want to sort of innovate or like break rules or do something weird that nobody's ever heard of you've actually got like this huge resource which is like the rest of the world like I think when maybe it's a little bit like more common for people to read more white I was growing up it was really hard you know like I I would have been like when people were you know, just first, like I used to have like a giant mobile phone with an aerial that was about three times the size of my head that I would have to call my mum on if I wanted to like have a big picture <laughs> from the party. So like, you know, like it was much harder to share poetry and read poetry. And so it was also a lot easier to like steal ideas from around the world and introduce them to this like national context where people had never heard anyone doing anything like, um, you know, like Mark Leidner's like, five page simile poems and so I think there is kind of you you do get like a really amazing chance to just kind of go really deep into whatever your interests are and I think that just like reading widely is a really good way to do that I don't know whether it's um yeah I don't know whether that's uh the same now because everybody is like much better internet <laughs> but that used to be the way to do it you know just like find things that nobody else has done before and... do you think the internet's good for poetry beg your pardon is that a train in the back yes it is <laughs> yeah, it, <we're, laughs> that was, that was... Nashville's known for our trains uh, <laughs> I you know the we talk we both work in the music industry and we are heavily involved in the music industry so talking to someone who's 
not necessarily in that field. My brain is still like trying to figure out um, how they're similar. And I, mm. the music industry, of course, has seen a huge change because of the development of the internet and streaming and whatnot. And um, so I wondered if you thought that the internet had had a positive impact on poetry. Yeah, totally. I think that's, <laughs> I think, um, you know, the internet has uh, changed um, everything so fast, but one of the areas in which it like seems to me to be unequivocally good is just people had just having access to work they never ever would have read in a million years before and I like I feel like I can see that in the new generation of work that's like we've got this amazing sort of poetry boom that's happening in New Zealand at the moment like everyone who's sort of in their early mid-20s publishing their first collections which is so um, formally weird and daring and experimental and like nothing I would have read 10 years ago and I think that a lot of it has to be to do with like people just finding amazing weird niche poetry on Tumblr instead of going through like um, you know the university poetry courses like everyone would have in the past and like I, I still see things shared around all of the time um, that you know I never 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 would have read in a million years if someone hadn't sort of posted a straight screen cap to Twitter or something but um, it's also just changed the you know humor so much like the, the way we talk to each other on the internet is just like t just kind of rebuilt language in a weird way so it's really hard to tell like what's just better exposure to <laughs> more diverse poetry from like around the world and history and what is just people getting smarter and, and faster and more linguistically weird all at once yeah that's super interesting mm -hmm. i mean one of the things that's cool about um the internet like you're saying is like the access to everything seems to be um a positive for writers and creative people because they have access to um like literally every single idea that's ever happened and but it's also a strange thing too because like the the um ownership and ideas of like copyright or like cultural appropriation or these ideas like start to um come into context with that conversation um like what? What do you uh, think? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 and everything changes so fast too. Um, and all of someone's energy and education and life experience being boiled down to this one screenshot that may get sent around. That's kind of odd. Yeah, for sure. And it's um like I one of my best friends um is a computer programmer, and actually that was something that I sort of learned to do last year because I was like, right, I need to figure out a way to become um, more employable, let's learn a skill. But one of the things that he um, built, like years and years ago, we used to do, like we got really obsessed with like um, old school, like cut up surrealism, like burrows and stuff like that. Not not really like the, the work of those people, but the techniques, that, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. So he kind of built this really amazing um, poetry um, generator, basically, like you can put any you can put like all of Frank O'Hara's poetry into the machine and it will take all of the nouns out of his work and it will replace the nouns in a Sylvia Plath poem with the nouns from a Frank O'Hara poem and so we used to do like things like that for for fun and like for like um using kind of like language neural networks to build weird metaphors and stuff like that and that seemed really weird and um experimental when we were doing it but now you can just like <laughs> type it into chat gpt i was gonna it, ask if you had played with that yeah but it's like to me it's not it's not that interesting like i used to the way we used to do it is like in order to get like good lines it sounded like poetry is you put like a Coleridge poem into the Google Translate and you translate it to Chinese and then you translate the Chinese to Russian and then you change that to Arabic and then you transit, translate it back into English and you'd end up with this kind of like... That's genius. Um, mysterious, like machine sort of translated thing that often had like such, a, such an amazing line in it which you'd then sort of rework and um, 
And that used to be a really fun way to do it. And I feel like that's sort of weirdly analogous to like, you know, I was talking about love and kids poetry because that's, that's sort of like, there are those like weird, unusual sparks there. But now I feel like chat, chat, I kind of, I don't know if it's chat GPT or chat GTP. I should have practiced saying GPT, that before I, I came. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's that guy. That's like to me. That's like got the the intelligence or the competence of like a twelve year old trying to impress a high school teacher, which doesn't make for good poetry, you know. Like <laughs> it's competent, but but you're never going to find like surprising, um, unreal, amazing connections there because it's, um, yeah, <clears throat> because it's really built for competence rather than. Um, know weird electric noun magic which is what i used to like using that sort of stuff for so i feel like yeah it's, it's actually not really helpful but i'm not like opposed to um you know feeding words into the machine in general and it, it also seems to be counter to what like the whole like, enterprise of poetry is all about which is you know a person's perspective and ability to like put images and thoughts and jokes and things together that are like uniquely th their own and chat gtp is it feels like a like it cheapens everything because you know you could just um there's there's no human behind the screen you know it's just like a mm -hmm. a faceless human like emotionless um like husk of a, a like a terror like it's a terrifying prospect to me like reading poetry generated by like a machine is weird and even like reading like marketing material generated by a machine sounds terrifying to me because it's <laughs> like i would i want to at least know that like some guy with a mustache in brooklyn like came up with my ad for the <laughs> shoes i'm buying you know yeah the weird thing is it always makes poems rhyme and it's like such a weirdly old school interpretation of poetry. Like, we've, you know, most of the stuff that it would be available presumably for it to look through is, you know, the last, what, 100 years has mostly been like blank, blank verse. And then you ask it to write a, a poem in blank verse and it will still give you these like really weird, cutesy rhyming couplets. So it's like, it's quite retro in a weird way. I'd be really interested to learn more about like why why it does that why it rhymes everything but maybe the p yeah. in chat gpt stands for poetry Ooh. <laughs> it's um, not very good no <laughs> i have i have tried to get it to write me some poems too but you're right it always rhymes maybe if you specifically ask it not to but still weird um <laughs> yeah it, one of the it's good as a tool though that's interesting that you did that one of the things that um, you mentioned earlier is your advice column, which is super great. It's really funny. And um, I wonder like how you approach your advice column, because it seems like a lot of your style, like your poetry style is in there. I read one today about like, there's this guy that wrote to you. He's like 26 and he's never had sex before. And you wrote like at 26, you could still quit your career and like, get a new career as a heart surgeon or something and you'd still have a long career left <laughs> a, i think i looked up the longest medical careers and one of them was um it, like to be a cardiovascular surgeon like apparently that's like 25 yeah i can't remember how much it is but i did the math so i was like well if you're 26 now and you're going to study for like another 10 years at medical school and then yeah you i think that's a good metric because you get so worried about your life running out when you're so young and, yeah you know you don't realize how easy, you know, it's, it's funny to me that, you know, 24 year olds are experiencing sunken cost fallacy for their whole lives. It's like, go back to school. You know, you've got your whole life ahead of you. But um, yeah, it is quite a fun job. I'm, I feel quite lucky to have landed the advice writing column because you get a fresh prompt every week. But also, you know, you've got a lot of, get a lot of opportunity to go off the rails. <laughs> Are you are you always looking for opportunities, like as a writer, to get paid like professionally? Are there ones that um, you wish you could do that you haven't tried yet, or like how do you go about looking for work? I would usually never want to write 
regularly for money because I don't have enough ideas. You know, like I, I think that's why one of the reasons the advice column is good because at least someone writes them with a prompt every week. But really, at the moment, this is like um, I've just bought my first house with my partner, and so <laughs> this is about paying the mortgage. You know, oh, wow. and so um, it's it is a really like it's a really amazing job. I'm really like lucky to have found it for myself but it does I still also kind of look there at the pile of work that I want to do that I won't get paid for that sort of you know the the projects that I've been working on for so long and I kind of feel a little bit sad about that because there's never really enough time to do everything the one that I always really really wanted if I could have any um prize or residency in the world I like I always wanted the Amtrak for like two years in America ran this like writer in residence on a train and I like fucking love trains. I would <laughs> go on that residency so hard. I would do the two year Amtrak <laughs> train residency if I could have absolutely anything that would be like my ideal. But um That sounds amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it it does sound amazing. My favorite I mean, we have lots of Oh I'm sorry. Oh no, no please tell me. My favorite <laughs> ad that i ever saw on a train i don't know if you watch law and order but jerry orbach the original like prosecutor on law Law and order (laughs) um had this train in new york city i mean had this ad in new york city for years um where it just said i gave my eyes to cancer and it was just a photo of jerry orbach and i gave my eyes to cancer was the text and he was dead and so he was like talking to you from the grave it was an amazing ad wow yeah, it's so spooky. <laughs> um, yeah, I've actually, I, I always forget until it rings in a crowded elevator, but the Law & Order theme song is like one of my favourite pieces of music ever. And it, I, I just have it on my regular playlist. So it, it's my like phone call when someone rings me. <laughs> and um, I've really got to change it because like there's, a, nobody really calls me that often apart from my mother. But like every time she does and I'm in public, you just hear dun 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone sort of turns around. <laughs> uh, there's a really amazing, I don't know if you guys know and read Mary Rufel. She's like an American poet who publishes with Wave Books and she's, um, she's just awesome. But she's got like this really amazing book of essays called Madness, Rack and Honey, which is just about the best writing on poetry I've ever read. And there's like one essay in there where she talks about like, um, lines that she's stolen from advertising. Like, I'm sure that she would love the, that, like, I gave my eyes to cancer. She just, <laughs> you know, there's, there's just this essay where she kind of goes through, like, all of the different um, bits of poetry-related, like, text that she's pulled out of, like, magazines and stuff all over the year. Wow. That sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. You've given us a lot of really good... Um book recommendations and author suggestions on this podcast so yeah when we go back through i'm gonna have to write all of them down so i can google them yeah for sure we are not erudite (laughs) Uh, i think everyone has enough like has about two hobbies you can afford to fully commit to and then after that you just need someone else in your life who's like like I, i i i don't know anything about films and so i rely on my partner to be like oh we should watch the new um Ari Aster or whatever because like I, <laughs> only enough room in my brain for children's books <laughs> we need yeah we need a poet friend so if you could step in to that role that would be really cool yeah, yeah. well I wanted to ask okay. you one final question because it relates to our podcast topic so like one of your titles of your books is pamper me to hell and back and mm. um you know pampering obviously has a lot to do with being in the Lux life, comfort. Um, so what would that actually look like for you if someone did that? Um, have to be in one of those sort of like snow piercer, um, 24 hour perpetual train situations. I think first of all, <laughs> if you're going to be on a train, <laughs> going back to the Amtrak, yeah. I think a good way to, you know, immediately upgrade the comfort level. Um, Actually, at the moment, I'm having like, um, we just moved into a new house a couple of weeks ago and I'm slowly setting it up. And um, it's actually been like quite luxuriously comfortable because one of the things I love to do when I like set up a new house is play maybe like five to seven seasons of 
old Survivor with Jeff Probst and like some <laughs> <put on. laughs> <laughs> and little places. So I'm up to um, Survivor Micronesia at the moment, season 16. And I'm just like having a beautiful time, like moving my little frog ornaments around my room. So I think that's like, that's the height of comfort. You know? what, that is what, amazing. What more can I ask for? Survivor comforts me too when I'm sick. I just put it on and NyQuil myself and have fever <laughs> dreams about <laughs> Survivor. <laughs> Oh, you should go on Survivor. All I want in life is to know someone who's gone on Survivor. I think you should apply. I think you'd be great. Oh, well, maybe you could do it and then write some poetry about it. That would be, I would definitely read that. And that could be Survivor merch. Agreed. Now we're monetizing. But we're going to poison the whole thing. (laughs) (laughs) One of my one of the things I would absolutely love for them to do on Survivor, Jeff Probst, if you are listening to this, like to to really like take the concepts to a next level because that you know they've done things like um, you know, or oh, they've done lots of horrible weird concept seasons before that should never be repeated. But like they've never had an entire cast of people called either Sue or Trevor, for instance. Like imagine that finding the most diverse cast possible from across the states who either had the name Sue or Trevor and like. <laughs> <laughs> and using that as a start. you could do an entire poets versus novelists season wow i always like hearing in the iowa writers workshop they say that they've got like a big softball game against the poets and the novelists every year and like the novelists usually win i think which sounds about right but that sounds like you know, the, so the laziest like- <laughs> game of baseball of all time <laughs> yeah, it does. and the most like out of shape game as well that would be really slow to watch <laughs> More just- Either that, or you've got some like guy who's like been sleeping two hours a night and like eating celery and like reading John Berryman like for twenty years straight, and like those people are Type A personalities. Like I reckon that some of those guys could definitely play play baseball. That's, that's true. <laughs> On that note, um, this has been an absolute pleasure. We, yes, we really appreciate you coming on. Oh, it's been so nice to talk to you guys. Sorry I didn't get to, the internet was so bad. I couldn't see your little pixelated faces. Thanks for listening to Devalued. For more information about our podcast, please visit devalued.show.